Hello, symbol lovers, and welcome to another edition of Understanding the Symbols of Hieronymus Bosch. And this time around, we're going to take another look at the temptation of St. Anthony, and we're going to figure out exactly which St. Anthony this is. And to accomplish that, we'll be using our six keys to understanding the symbols of Hieronymus Bosch. So the confusion comes in because the two St. Anthonys, Anthony of Padua and Anthony the Great, have symbols in common. So first we'll look at Anthony the Great, which is how most art historians identify the Anthony in the picture. He became a Christian before there was a Bible or a Catholic Church. Uh, he took to heart the words of Jesus who said, give your money to the poor and uh, pick up your torture stake and follow. And so that staff actually represents the torture stake of Jesus. And just as Jesus didn't have a place to lay his head, so St. Anthony was determined to live the same way. So. He went off to uh, live in a, among the tombs and for a while supported himself herding swine. Uh, but living in the tombs was just too much big city life for him. So he then went on to famously live out in the desert in an old Roman fort on a hilltop. He went to Alexandria when he heard the Christians there were under persecution, and when the persecution was over, he returned to the desert, but by then he had gathered so many followers that he had to organize them into a monastery with his famous Book of Rules. During his lifetime, he saw Constantine the Great become emperor, convert to Christianity, and he saw his bishops organized the book that became the Bible. He didn't take part in the crafting of the Bible, the selecting of books and declaring it the inerrant word or anything like that. Um, so he stood outside the church that way. And that's one reason why he would be an icon for heretics. In case I haven't mentioned it often enough, Hieronymus Bosch was a heretic and the Council of Nicaea and the creation of the Bible was considered the great tragic turning point in history because it was the marriage of church and state. The symbols associated with uh, Anthony the Great are that T-shaped walking stick, which is very important in the imagery of Hieronymus Bosch, uh, but also he's famous for his bell, his book, because he sort of wrote out the laws for how to be a monk. But he's also associated with a pig. He had a pet pig for a while, and I believe he was a vegetarian. Uh, also, he's got that white beard because he lived to be 105 years old. So every time you see Anthony the Great, they are sure to tack on that nice white beard to emphasize how old he was. And he was famously tormented by sex and boredom. And, um, oh, and he's associated with the animals, not only with the pig, but also with the centaur the satyr and the two lions that came and dug his grave when he died. Uh, that's a pretty cool myth to have associated with you. You were such a great man that lions appeared and dug your grave. Anyway, those are the animals and the various objects associated with Anthony the Great, but Anthony of Padua is a different story. Notice that none of, well, not none, but very few of the symbols of Anthony the Great are present. We do see attacking demons, we do see a book, we do see a walking stick, but we don't see a long white beard, a bell, or a scroll. We don't see a 
centaur, a satyr, or two lions, or a pig. Um, we don't see a fleecy coat. We don't see a cave. So all these symbols for Anthony the Great are missing. However, we do see symbols of Anthony of Padua. Anthony the Great and Anthony of Padua had much in common. They both came from wealthy families. They both forsook their wealthy families. They were both well-educated. They both tried to apply the teachings of Jesus from the Sermon on the Mount. They were both monks, and they both suffered the torments of monks. Keep in mind that what was tormenting these monks were things like loneliness, skin rashes, flea bites, rats, boredom, and doubt. But for the storytellers of the church and for artists, uh, these explanations would never do. So all these things became demon. And of course, demons are magic, and there is no such thing as magic. One reason that they think this is Anthony the Great, I guess, is because he seems to be having his vision in an old Roman fort or a ruin. But if you look close, you'll notice that pillar. It's a very Jewish pillar. At the top, we see Moses receiving the Ten Commandments, and below him, we see dancers around the golden calf. And there at the bottom, we see the spies returning from the land of Israel. So there wouldn't be a Jewish pillar in a Roman fort. So this is not the Roman fort. I would suggest that Anthony of Padua is kneeling in the, the ruins of Western civilization, of which the Jewish teachings and philosophy would be a part. So Anthony of Padua has become a footstep follower of Anthony the Great and he's found a fort of his own. And, like Anthony the Great, he's turning his back on the marriage of church and state and has found Jesus. So this is the very moment when Anthony of Padua realized the heretics were right. But now let's look at the symbols that are attached to Anthony of Padua. So this is Anthony of Padua, and he's standing next to his good buddy, St. Francis of Assisi. St. Francis is showing off his stigmata, and Anthony is showing his fish. Anthony of Padua was famous for preaching to the fish. And so the story is that Anthony was sent to dispute with the heretics, but the heretics in this particular town wouldn't listen to him so he began to preach to the river, and the fish gathered, and the fish listened to him. And this so impressed the townspeople that they rejected the heresy and listened to St. Anthony. And so he's forever tied to fish. Getting back to our symbols here, is this St. Anthony having any hallucinations involving fish? Why, yes, he is. He's got flying fish. He's got fish inside of fish. He's got rolling fish. He's got fish that are boats that are catching fish. He's got fillet of fish. He's got flying fish. He's got tormenting fish. He's got fighting fish. Holy mackerel, there are a lot of fish in the temptation of St. Anthony. This is Anthony of Padua. Anthony Padua died young. He never grew a long white beard. He died at about 35. Another reason to believe this is Anthony of Padua is that the images in the left-hand panel seem very specific to his life. At the top, we have Anthony on a spiritual journey. Below that, we have the symbol of that boat on the ocean, taking an ocean journey. Below that, we have a crossroads. And we have below that, directly, we have St. Anthony crossing a bridge. So he's crossing a bridge. He's at a crossroads. Above him is an 
ocean-going crossing, and above that is a spiritual crossing, or at least a spiritual journey of some sort. So everything is talking about Anthony transforming or going from one stage to another. Now let's do follow the money. So in the center we have Anthony of Padua receiving a glorious enlightenment. But on the left-hand panel, we see the events leading up to that enlightenment. The story of Anthony of Padua goes that when he met St. Francis of Assisi, he was, St. Francis was so impressed with him that he put him in charge of supervising all the teachings at all the monasteries. But almost as soon as he got put into that position, he had to go before the Pope and take part in a great debate. And what they were debating was whether or not the monks owned all those monasteries. And St. Anthony of Padua, arguing with, on behalf of St. Francis of Assisi, was saying, no, we are following the rules laid down by Anthony the Great. And everyone knows Anthony the Great didn't own anything. But the Pope said, you know what? You guys own 19 monasteries and I want my kickback. And uh, with that, he sent more or less Anthony of Padua into exile, uh, kindly relieving him of all responsibilities. And with that, the monks more or less split into two groups the nice peaceful monks like St. Anthony of Padua and St. Francis, and the crazy violent monks like the one portrayed by Hieronymus Bosch on the outside panels of The Temptation of St. Anthony. And these are the monks that ran the Spanish Inquisition. And there was a rumor that after the debate, Anthony was beaten viciously by a few of his fellow monks, and that's why he had to be carried off, to, and that's why he died so young. We will speak no more of the tragedy of St. Anthony, but we will sum up by looking at three more paintings from the workshop of Bosch. Not by Bosch, but from his workshop. And so this first one is the standard Anthony the Great. It is not great. I think they just copied a bunch of stuff from his notebook onto the canvas. It's pretty slapdash. But still, you get the feeling of the desert and the heat. This painting is attributed to the Bosch workshop as well. And this is Anthony of Padua. You see the L-shaped walking stick. He's got a monk uniform. He's by a river. There's fish. It's nice, lush, and green. And there's a table of half-eaten food because his job at the monastery was washing the dishes after the meals. So by now, you should be an expert. Which Anthony is this? He's by a river. He's wearing a uniform. Uh, he looks like he's in northern Italy, um, and he's in a tree. Anthony of Padua lived in a tree for the last year and a half of his life. And so, why is there a pig there? The person that did this was lazy. They were just filling an order, and they themselves confused the two St. Anthonys. And this final proof that this is Anthony of Padua Notice that right-hand panel. What's Anthony looking at? That's right, another table full of dirty dishes left by mischievous monks. So now you know which Anthony is which and why you shouldn't join a monastery. And those are just some of the benefits you get from understanding the symbols of Hieronymus 